Uh, good evening, my name is Jay Wegman. I'm the director of the Skirball Center, and I welcome you here to the Skirball Center. Uh, tonight, we have a really great talk. It was organized with the Bradamus Center in DC, uh, and we thank them very much. Yeah, good. I'm going to introduce um, our host this evening, who's uh, Jonathan Capert. He is a yes, he is a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist. He's a member of the Washington Post editorial board. He writes about politics and social issues on the opinion section of their website, and he also hosts the Cape Up podcast. He's a regular commentator on uh, MSNBC. And he also serves as a regular guest host on Midday on WNYC on New York Public Radio. Without further ado, Jonathan Capert. <laughs> Come on, this is good. Hi, thank you very much. Please have a seat. How I have to take this picture for when this, when we publish this at the Post. So I have to make sure I've got a good picture of everybody. Sit down. Nice, Donna. Thanks. <clears throat> oh, I'm done. Um, <laughs> sorry, Donna. Thank you all very much for for being here for this special um, live recording and live streaming of Cape Up with John the Capehart. Uh, here at NYU Skirball Center for the Performing Arts. And seated before you are affectionately known as the Colored Girls. And I'm going to go from, le from my left to right. Leah Daughtry, Reverend Leah Daughtry. She was the CEO of the 2008 and 2016 Democratic National Conventions. She was a former chief of staff to Howard Dean when he was the DNC chair, and she is the pastor of the House of the Lord Church in Washington, D.C. Right. Yolanda Carraway, president and CEO of the Carraway Group. She was the deputy assistant political director for the Mondale Ferraro 84 general election director of the DNC's Fairness Commission in 1985, chief of staff to the National Rainbow Coalition, the 1988 Jesse Jackson for President campaign, so far so good, and deputy chair of the Democratic <laughs> National Committee under Chairman Paul G. Kirk. You did your homework. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mignon Moore. Mignon leads um, Dewey Square Group's state and local affairs and multicultural strategies practices she was assistant to the president and director of the Ho White House Public Affairs Office and also White House liaison, correct? Political director. Pol pol just political director mm -hmm. under President Bill Clinton. She was the CEO of the Democratic National Convention in 2000 mm -hmm. and served as an advisor to the presidential campaigns of Reverend Jesse Jackson in 1984 and 1988. And I think right after you got out of college, you worked at Rainbow Push. That's correct. We'll get into all, all this stuff in a bit. And then, last but not least, Donna Brazil, former chair of the Democratic National Committee, interim chair in two, uh, two, uh, no, I, I got it, in 2011, <laughs> and then again in 2016 when all that stuff went down. And she's also the author, the author of, of Hacks, right. which came out last year, which caused some problems with, I'm, I mean, not, I'm not talking about the, the, the controversy around the book, I'm talking about with, with the four of you, but we'll get there, <laughs> maybe. All right, so if you, if, you, if you haven't read the book yet, the book starts um, on July 26, 2016. President Clinton was addressing the Democratic National Convention and he was talking about his wife before she was to accept the Democratic presidential nomination. And you collectively write, we sat facing him on the convention dais. Who are we? We're the colored girls, four African-American women who had been a part of his political life since he first entered politics on a national level. It was an unprecedented moment because we have, throughout our lives, been somewhat hidden figures in American politics. And so I want to start 
with the title of the book, why do you proactively and insistently call yourselves the colored girls? Where did that come from? Oh, now, oh, y'all shy? <laughs> Go ahead, Don. I love it when they tell me I can talk. <laughs> Let's see how many, how many hours I have to get this out. There are no hours, we have minutes. <laughs> OK. Well, first of all, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, uh, NYU, uh, for being here, and all of you uh, for coming out uh, this evening. We are, as you can tell, women of color. We have spent our entire careers trying to not only um, redefine our own experience as political operatives, but we have spent our careers in trying to open doors for others. Our mothers and our ancestors taught us that once you get in the door, you should leave it open for every, everyone else. But this particular title, as you all know, is, is one that we, we also borrow from a great writer, essayist, and poet, Ntozaki Shange, who recently passed away. You might recall her, uh, her wonderful uh, play for colored girls who considered suicide. But for us, it started in 1988 when Mignon and I were both on a Dukakis campaign. And one evening we learned that the senior level staffers uh, had decided to move the operations up. And those of us who were still part of the senior team but perhaps didn't have the titles, we were supposed to stay down, downstairs. So during that wonderful cocktail hour, we went up to the ninth floor where they all had their newly you know, painted offices. We, Mignon and I found an open door, but it was a conference room perhaps for the chair of the campaign. We decided to rearrange the furniture, put chairs and tables in there, and then we named it for color girls. And it was our way of saying that we were going to be a part of the process, a part of the conversation, and a part of the political campaign that would define our lives and, of course, the future of our country. So that's the way we got the color Okay, well, from. Donna, the, the, you left out a key the, part of, of what was on, on then, that sign. That's Mignon? Right. And I was going to add that because that was <laughs> the most important part. It was for color girls, we shall not be moved. And that's, that's the sign that stayed up on that door. And I think the important part about that is it became an opening for everybody that felt like that they were locked out of the campaign or felt like their voice wasn't heard. They just all flocked to that office and they all became a color girl, whether they were white, black, gay, blue, everybody that felt like they wanted to have a voice ended up in that office by the end of the campaign. Um, you write on page 42 um, I'm assuming, I, I still have the uncorrected proof that I, that I read, so it might still be 42 uh, in, the, in, in the final edition. But you write, we come from very different backgrounds and have very different styles of how to get the job done. The ideas that black women are a monolith has always made Washington a tough place to navigate for black women, some view as not fitting what their white colleagues considered, considered to be the norm. Mm -hmm. Leah... Yolanda, amplify that, if you could. Great, say, say the question again. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's what you, the, the idea that um, you, you all come from very different backgrounds and have very different styles of how to get things done. And you're right, the idea that black women are a monolith has always made Washington a tough place to navigate yeah, for black yeah. women, some view as not fitting what their colleagues considered to be the norm. Well, when we came along, we were probably pretty much it. We didn't have a lot of company. There weren't, you know, there weren't a lot of, and I, I was probably 10 years before. Don and, Don and I actually met around the same time um, in uh, the early 80s. And there just weren't enough of us. There weren't any of us. Now, you know, we, we've, we've worked for 30 years in this business, and it is a business, um, and we've brought on so many other young people, and, um, it's just remarkable. I love what we're seeing today and what's just happening at the midterms. Mm -hmm. And Leah? I think that you know, for, particularly when we were uh, coming through in our careers and there weren't a lot of us, and for the majority community, their experience and their understanding of who black people were and who black women were was defined by the narratives that they saw on television or mm -hmm. in the movies or, mm -hmm. you know, there wasn't, uh, a lot of them didn't have any 
uh, experience in, with African American communities. They didn't and, know any black people. They didn't know yeah, no black people. Okay, come on. Let's, <laughs> <laughs> come on. They didn't know invisible. no black people. Yeah, yeah. We're we're my Brooklyn yeah. Right. So, so when we come along, then they have this idea of who you are supposed to be, mm -hmm. and what you are supposed to represent. And you have four of us. Don is from the South. I'm from Brooklyn. Yolanda's from Rochester, Mianna's from Chicago. We all had different kinds of experiences. Going, we were four different personalities. If you had all of us, all, all of us at the table, and so it challenged their idea about who black women were, who black women should be, and how they interact with us. Because you can't interact with us as a monolith. Mm -hmm. There are, the, right. there are, you know, 12 million. Na name a number of black people. That's that many ways to be black, mm -hmm. right? So you, there's no one way to maneuver or to deal with us, and they quite didn't quite know how to handle that. You know, um, I'm gonna jump ahead, because this actually e echoes what um, you say later on in the book, where you say, um, what we don't know, we're going to make up for it in hard work. The Jackson campaign, we didn't know a thing about running a presidential campaign, but we knew how to work hard. And this mm -hmm. is the key piece. Yeah. Just being black in America means you have to be versatile and you have to have a dexterity of language and a dexterity of movement and be able to shift. Read the tea leaves of what's ahead, but mm -hmm. also deal with what's in the cup right now. That's just how you, that's just how you are when you're black in America because we deal with multiple cultures and we are bi and tri and quadrilingual in this nation. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's true. Yeah. It's true. Look, I, I speak Brooklyn. I speak black mm -hmm. Brooklyn. <laughs> I speak church. <laughs> I speak white people. <laughs> I speak old people. <laughs> I mean, it's a different, it's a di depending on what community you're yeah. in, yeah. Mm -hmm. you got to navigate because we don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. we, our our day-to-day -day existence requires us to be in all of these communities. And I went to Dartmouth, I met a lot of people. I was the first black person they ever knew. So they lived their entire lives, 18 years without encountering black people. I don't have that luxury. None mm -hmm. of us have that luxury. Right. But you know what I learned though? When I, the more leadership you get, the more you have to see people. It doesn't matter what color they are, because what I learned, if it's a, especially if it's a young person, all they want to know is, do she see me? Does yep. she hear me? Can I tell her that I can do the job? And sometimes when you walk into these rooms, when you look like us, we don't have the luxury of not seeing everybody, which is the, which is the burden we bear. Because sometimes we just like to be Brooklyn. And, and sometimes. And I'd love to be Chicago, because, you know, we, we're activists. And, <laughs> we love, I'd love and, to be and, Chicago. And sometimes I think we, we received the assignments that no one else wanted. Right. It was always the toughest assignment, the assignment that paid the least amount of money, if it paid at all, uh, the assignment where the stakes were high, so if you fail, guess what? It meant the end of your career, you had to yeah. go back and start all over again. But nevertheless, we were able, I think, given our background and our talents and our skill, our skill set, uh, we were able to overcome those odds. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mentioned while Leah was talking, she, you know, she could preach, she can talk like white people, Brooklynites and <laughs> New Yorkers. I cuss. <laughs> <laughs> I use profanity in very artful ways. Oh. Um, oh, and um, just read if you, ooh, there's a scene in Hacks in Donna's book when she has a throwdown with the quote, white boys oh, in Brooklyn. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go on. Well, I'm not going to talk about that experience, but I'm going to just say this. You can talk about the experience in, for colored girls when you leave the office, you leave Donna by herself, and you say, Donna, please don't curse anybody out. You come back, Donna, and curse everybody out. Well, you know, <laughs> one of the reasons why I used to love whenever they said Mignon and I were on the same team and we had the same, you know, uh, office. And by the way, I, I've been her intern. So I just want to let you know I've grown up a lot since then. Uh, but... <laughs> because some people will just slow your roll and they don't know they're slowing your roll and they're staring at you because they think they know, quote unquote, they know the community better than you. And I'm like, oh, hell no. <laughs> Been there, done that, got the ribs, the fried chicken, the collard greens. And this was before kale was country. <laughs> and and when Mignon would leave the room, I said, didn't I tell y'all, take y'all, you know what, home? Yeah. 
But you know what? The bottom line is that we got in the room and we made a difference because we, we kept that door open. We brought in folding chairs, as Shirley Chisholm once told us, the Honorable Shirley Chisholm from Brooklyn. And also, we kept the door open for others. And so when you look at the rules of the Democratic Party today, whether you look at the Fairness Commission and the work that Yolanda and that team did, or you look at the work that we have done over the last 20 years in ensuring that we had a, what, a black nominee and a female nominee, that's work that we have done. And back during those days and doing that work, it was not easy. We were ostracized, marginalized, told us, shut up, get out the room, don't bring this one in the room. I remember when the Democratic Party wouldn't take, would not take money from gay donors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Leah can tell you stories when, when Ron Brown became chair of the party where they didn't think Ron could raise money. Right. So we've been through that, and we've seen a lot. And we want to continue to see the change and the progress because we're not done yet. We're just, we're just getting comfortable in our seats. Well, you, can you, somebody just bring us a drink? <laughs> <laughs> well, how about let's, let's go to the very beginning. And I would love for each of you to real quickly talk about, and I'll start with you, Leah, talk about that moment. That moment when you knew that this business, as Yolanda calls it correctly, this business was what you wanted to be a part of. Well, I'd always been activist as part of my church upbringing. Uh, my dad is here, I think. I saw Reverend, Reverend, Reverend Herbert Dodge. Reverend Dodge. Hey, there Reverend. he is, right in the front. Hey, Reverend. See, I didn't curse, Reverend. I said I used cuss words. <laughs> <laughs> That's my daddy. I'm uh, in my part time. I'm president of the Daddy's, Ga Daddy's Girl Club of America. <laughs> yeah. um, so we'd always been activists and always been politically engaged and involved. But it wasn't until I got to Dartmouth um, when I was making my own decisions because I thought I was grown then. <laughs> and Reverend Jackson, who I'd known all of my life, was running for president in 1984, and he asked me to um, help organize my part of New Hampshire. And I didn't know what I was doing, but I said, sure, why not? Um, we, why not? I'll, I'll try. If he thinks I can do it, I'll try to do it. And what, what struck me about his campaign in that moment was it was Dartmouth. It was the first term of Ronald Reagan. Uh, the campus was a hotbed of Ronald Reagan conservatism. I was at school with Laura Ingraham and Dinesh D'Souza. We were all there at the same time. Nice crowd. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they haven't changed a bit. Um, <laughs> but what, was, what, what, what I marveled at was all these people who had so much to say about Reverend Jackson and his politics, and they denigrated him all year long. When that man arrived on campus, they all were asking for tickets. They all wanted to be part of his orbit. They all wanted to ask him questions. And how the way that he was able to dissect issues and make them relevant to everyone changed minds, changed perspectives. And I saw that right then the potential of what a Jackson presidency could bring to America, and if not, Mm -hmm. If we won in a different kind of way, mm -hmm. if we won by changing hearts and minds, what it would do to the politics of the nation. And that was a crystallizing moment for me. And mm -hmm. I said, I've, this is something that matches with the principles of my faith and with the principles of what, how I was raised. And I see how I can make Brooklyn better mm -hmm. uh, through, the, through electoral politics. Mm -hmm. Yolanda, what was it for you? Well, I got bitten by the bug very early in life. I was 14. And uh, I lived in Rochester, New York, and um, a friend of mine, I was in, back in those days, in Rochester, you had one high school, you went from elementary school to high school, there was no middle school. So I'm 14 years old in high school, which is not a very good thing, but <laughs> neither here nor there. Um, a friend of mine asked me one day, she said, why don't you come down and volunteer uh, to work on Bobby Kennedy's campaign? He was running for the Senate in New York State. And you know, President Kennedy had been assassinated the year before, and we all love President Kennedy, so I didn't know that much about his brother, but I said, well, you know, he's got to be a decent guy, so sure. Plus, I never wanted to go home after school anyway, so he gave me something. <laughs> to do. So I, ca I caught the bus all the way from one end of town to the other end of town every day. And 
I sat there and I licked envelopes and, and I made phone calls to people. And by the end of the campaign, they sent me out to knock on doors. And I actually, my little 14 year old self knew what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. And I just, I realized, I, I, I thought I wanted to be, and I think that was like the same summer that I was can candy striper because I wanted to be a doctor. But then <laughs> once I saw the first piece, first bit of blood, that was it, I left that, I could not do that. So this is a, something different for me. So I wanted to help people, but I found out this is a different way to help people. Minyan? For me, it uh, boils down to this woman. And if you don't know her, I ask that you look her up because she is probably one of the unsung heroes of this generation and this world, Reverend Willie Taplin Barrow. She took me under her wings when I was fresh out of college. I was not born of politics. I wasn't even involved in politics. And she decided she saw something in me and she opened me up to a world that I probably would have never seen had it not been for her. And if you don't know her, there's a professor here who is my god sister, Professor Carrie. Pat Carrie, go see her. She can tell you all about her. <laughs> but she, um, she exposed me to so much. A lot of people talk about Reverend Jackson, but she was the wind under Reverend Jackson's mm -hmm. legs because she was the chair, she was the steady, she was the person that was always there when he was off doing his thing. She was the person that was running Operation Push. She was the person that was meeting with leaders. She was mm -hmm. the person that was keeping him sane. She was the person that was keeping him out of trouble. Mm -hmm. But she was also <laughs> the person that was generously opening up the doors to young people like me and letting us see a world that most people don't get mm -hmm. to see. I got to know Coretta Scott King because of Reverend Jackson. I got to know Harold Washington because of her. I got to know Rosa Parks because of her. I got to know Betty Shabazz because of her. So for her, for, for me, had she not exposed me to that, I probably would have tried to be a Supreme Court justice, but then I realized <laughs> you have to be appointed. And I just like, I didn't know that. And then I got off that train like Yolanda did. Yeah, oh. <laughs> I flew all the way up to Washington. <laughs> and went to the Supreme Court thinking I was going to get one of them black robes one day, and I forgot you had to be appointed. I didn't know. I was too young. Well, you better go to Walmart. I, I'd be well, a listen, we got one. <laughs> I'm going to give me a black robe still. You should right. get a black robe for sure. It's Black Friday. Something should be free. Uh, well, I got, my, I got the bug at the age of uh, nine. Um, no sooner than Dr. King uh, was murdered, then I, I, I felt that, that calling. Uh, growing up in the South, um, my parents and my grandparents talked about, uh, you know, the current events, and I felt this, this tug inside of me. I was a little girl, but I had a, a great big imagination, and I kept telling my mom that I wanted to be a civil rights worker. I wanted to work. I wanted to, you know, help Dr. King and help the movement. 12 years after his assassination, I was in Washington, D.C. Uh, at that point, I was old enough to uh, be an activist, and I got a chance to meet Ralph Abernathy, who introduced me to Coretta Scott King. And from Coretta Scott King, I started working on the, uh, the holiday effort uh, across the country. I got so to meet met. Yolanda when I was lobbying. I was a lobbyist. I was an activist. I was an organizer. As I said, you know, back then, you didn't get paid. You just did a lot of work. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of fancy titles, no paycheck. <laughs> Uh, but I did get to eat a lot. I don't know how. Uh, but I got my calling was, I think, because of my background. Uh, my parents were very passionate about justice and equality. And I wanted to follow in the footsteps of those who were taking bold steps to hurry history. And that's why I got that call. And I've been involved ever since. Let's see. Uh, the last I counted, uh, I've worked on seven presidential campaigns I got paid. Uh, uh, 19 state and local campaigns, 56 congressional campaigns. I don't count the campaigns where I don't get paid. I've worked in 49 states. One more state, I'm going to become Miss USA without the bikini. So <laughs> I have a real passion, and I'm, I am proud, like Yolanda mentioned earlier, I am so proud of the women that we elected. Last week, two weeks ago, we saw history in the making. And had, had my mentor, Shirley Chisholm, live to see this moment. She would be so proud of so many of these young women and men, too, who will be representing us in Congress. I am, I am so proud. I'm, I'm, ready for, I'm ready for all of the fresh blood. I thought we had to go to Count Dracula to get new blood, 
for the Democratic <laughs> Party, but I'm so glad that we don't have to get it from Crown Dracula. Well, you, you, you just mentioned um, about how you, you worked on a lot of things, and a lot of things were free. And um, I think, Donna, mm -hmm. you talk about how you, you, you remember that you met Jesse through Coretta, and yes. I met Coretta through Ralph Abernathy. Mm -hmm. and, when, um, and when they all come into your life, you're never the same person you were before. Yeah. Once these civil rights leaders got to know you and trust you, you worked for them, most of the time without pay. Mm -hmm. Service comes cheap, but it's highly rewarded. You're instantly in the family, not like your biological parents. Right. The civil rights movement connects you to another form of DNA. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it metabolizes, when it metabolizes, you're hooked for life, in service until the end. I can't remember which one of you, because I've wa tried to watch all of your previous in interviews, <laughs> and um, maybe, no, I think it was you, Leah, talking about Dr. Dorothy Height. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And how you lived in the same building as she did, Mm -hmm. And you would get a phone call. You would get a phone call. You all would get a phone yeah, call in the morning. We all calls, but she got and, most of them. <laughs> and you would get this phone call, and they would be your orders for the day. For mm -hmm. the day. <laughs> yes, she would call at, and, you, and we lived in the same building, and you have to understand, Dr. Height went to work every morning at 7 a.m. Uh, until she became too ill when she was 98 years old is when she stopped working. So she would call you at some hour, that you were not, you were barely lucid, and you, it had to be one of them <laughs> who was bold enough to call you at such an ungodly <laughs> hour. And you pick up the phone, she said, Miss Daughtry, because you never were called by your first name, you were always Miss mm -hmm. or Mr. Whoever. Miss Daughtry, yeah, good morning, Dr. Height. This is what I need today. I'd like you to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine things. Like you didn't have a job. <laughs> she had a list of things that she needed for the day. I learned to keep a pen and notebook by my phone because you couldn't tell her to hold on because she was too busy talking <laughs> to yep. tell you what she wanted. And when she and she said, so if you could let me know by noon, thank you, click, <laughs> no goodbye, just and you we hold the phone going, oh, okay, well, let me get up and get on this mm -hmm. because she's expecting an answer by noon and there was no way you were not going to mm -hmm. get her what it, and whatever it was she wanted. And sometimes it was very small things and sometimes it was, it was they were very large things. <laughs> 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 Ms. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Height, you know, and once she, Leah is right, when she had your number, she had your number. And she would call Miss Brazil, good morning, Dr. Height. And I was anticipating, here it comes. She said, I need two parking passes uh, for the capital of the United States, and I need a platform seat, two platform seats. For the inaugural. For, for, for President Obama's first inaugural. Oh. You know, that was the hottest ticket in Washington, D.C. Oh, D. yeah. yeah. And, and, and I, before I could <laughs> even explain to her that that's, I can't get you tickets to that, <laughs> and you can't park at the United States Capitol, only the president and the president-elect, right? And she just hung up the phone. <laughs> but Leah just said, you can't tell her no. So no. what did you tell her? She well, you didn't get phone. a chance to you tell her. You get it done. She got to get it done. You get it done. And so you, you sit back and you say to yourself, God, how am I going to get this you one? figure out who you can and call. And you know what? I, I, something clicked. I called Nancy Pelosi's office. <laughs> and I got my two tickets because remember, she was a speaker at that yeah. point. I got my two tickets. See, that's why we got to have women in power. <laughs> and then her office told me to call Diane Feinstein. Uh, and and that's how, no, I got my parking space from Nancy, and I got my tickets from Diane Feinstein. So you but got you to do resourceful. Oh, no. And that you know you who sat that. with her? Uh, um, Dr. King's uh, sister, Christine uh, Ferris. Ferris yep. That was her guest. That was her person. And you know, to me, sitting on that stage that day, I was way up in the bleachers, of course, looking down, I said, wow. Dr. Hyde is there. There's never a note I mean, for them. You, you, she was one of the original mm -hmm. 10 with Dr. King. Mm -hmm. She's the one who, you know, called, she called him Martin. And, you know, just to witness that history down there, it just felt so good. When she moved uh, apartments, um, Dr. Hyde, and I was part of the helping her get organized, and then I was in the bed, I had bedroom duty. So I was cleaning out the things from under the bed, <laughs> and I opened up a box, and there's the Spingarn medal. Mm -hmm. And then I opened up this other box, and there's this letter, Dear Dorothy, Love Martin. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. I was afraid to touch it, 
Mm. Martin, I was like, Martin, that's Martin Luther King. Alexis, <laughs> <laughs> there's a letter in here from Martin. And I left it in the box. I was like, I don't want to touch it. I don't, I mean, this is like a real letter, a handwritten letter to her from Martin mm -hmm. and then her spin arm medal is just in a box under the bed. And when you say Alexis, you mean Alexis Herman, Herman yes. mm -hmm. who went on to become Secretary, Secretary of, of Labor, Labor. Labor. Mm -hmm. under President Clinton. Yes, That's right. second Clinton. Okay, second Clinton, mm -hmm. second term. Second, second term. term. Okay, so we talked, we, we mentioned how, <laughs> no, second Clinton yeah. gotta, gotta be clear, yeah, got some Obama tender, one, some tender feelings. As well. Still some tender feelings. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> So your story about Dr. Hyatt being in her two platform seats at the inauguration of President Obama mm -hmm. is um, a great way to get into what you all say in this book. And it comes through, I didn't appreciate how important Reverend Jackson's presidential campaign was mm -hmm. until I read uh, in your book from your varying perspectives mm -hmm. about what it meant, not just him as a person, mm -hmm. but that campaign, what he stood for, mm -hmm. how it worked. How did each of you get, get involved in the campaign? How important was it at the time that he was running for president? Did you even know how significant mm -hmm. it was for him to run? I don't think we, well, I don't know. I can speak for myself. I, Donna actually worked on the first one. I didn't. I worked on the second one. I was at the I DNC. And um, I, it, it was kind of like, Jesse's running for what? And, you know, it was kind of like that around, around the office. And there were a few black people there, there then, maybe five or six. But we, you know, we would get together in caucus and, and talk about it. And, you know, as he went on and as we saw him, it started to make more and more sense. You know, at first people were saying, he's not really going to do this. But yes, he did. And he, did, he didn't embarrass us. He made us proud. You know, he ran a, de a decent campaign the first time. The second time was even better. Mm -hmm. um, and he changed, I mean, he changed Democratic politics. He put so many, we registered so many people to vote both times, mm -hmm. um, brought in new people un under, under the tent, the LGBT community, mm -hmm. which nobody wanted to be bothered Hispanics. with at that point. Hispanics. Hispanics. Yep. Hispanics, labor, yep. Native yep. Americans, poor people, disabled. the only yeah. one, and probably the only one since then, except John Ed Edwards, I think, that talk about poverty. Mm -hmm. Right and went to visit people, you know, went, went to West Virginia and all those places to visit people. I remember going with him one time, we were in Nashville, and these people had built an estate underneath the railroad track, literally. I mean, they had jerry-rigged um, electricity. They mm. found ways to get water. It was a little community, and it was just amazing. But there were pockets of people like this. He called attention to them. Nobody knew about them. Mm -hmm. But we always focus on 2008 as that great awakening mm -hmm. um, in American politics when we saw the first viable female candidate and the mm -hmm. first viable African-American candidate. And I kept telling people, wait, mm -hmm. Reverend Jackson almost made it to the top in 1988. Mm -hmm. 88, yep. yep. 1988 could have been the year that Reverend yep. Jackson could have won it. Won the won the Democratic mm -hmm. primary. Yeah. He he was only you one mean the or nomination. two. Nations. The nomination. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 He, was, yeah. he could have won the nomination. Yeah, very close. But I got involved right after we finished the 20th anniversary of Dr. King's historic march. We knew we had enough signatures. Ronald Reagan, you know, Tip O'Neill went to Ronald Reagan. Reagan promised to sign the bill. We got it through Congress, and there was this energy in Chicago with Reverend um, Harold Washington campaign. Yep. And there was this whole thing about black leadership and what was happening in the black community. Come alive, community. October 5th. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and because, I mean, I was 23 at yep. the time. And, you know, when Reverend Jackson called us to put together the quote unquote, the announcement, we only had less than a week. But the campaign was like that. We had less than <laughs> a month to get him on the ballot. And then we had less than two months to get him ready for the first caucuses. And yet, Revan trusted us with this, this enormous responsibility, mm -hmm. and you know, he changed history. And I, I did 80. Oh, you did 80. Yeah, I did, I did 88. 84. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I can distinctly remember is that he put people, he put women in particular mm -hmm. in places, yep. he put African Americans in places that we can compete with our white counterparts when it came to other campaigns. Mm -hmm. Because part of the process is you don't know what you're doing or you don't have the experience. And as a result of those two campaigns, 
we had gained enough experience to even run campaigns as one of us did do. And the other thing I think he did was he shined a light on people like his CFO, who was an African-American woman. His pilots mm -hmm. were African-American. His, his lead Secret, uh, Secret Service. Service person was an African-American. And it showed African-Americans that not only can we run for office, but we are also professional. Mm -hmm. And I, by the time I did Michigan, California, I was introduced to Auntie Maxine when I got to California. You don't play with Auntie Maxine when you're <laughs> no. in a state. That's all I can tell you. She put a couple of us out. It wasn't me, though. <laughs> it was not me. She put you out, but you know, you saw her in her. You saw her in her form. Then when we got to Michigan, he had a man by the name of Joe Ferguson running his campaign, and I remember how precise. Joe. Joe was about carving out different territory for Reverend Jackson to go in. It wasn't just in the urban corridors. He would take them into Flint. He would take them into all rural these areas. Ex yeah, rural areas. And then we woke up, and my God, he had won Michigan. Mm -hmm. And it scared the stew out of us I because we were like, oh, he could really <laughs> win oh this. Oh, my God. <laughs> Reverend Jackson had won. I mean, the whole, it changed the whole trajectory because sure at that point, he became the front runner. And it scared the party, I'm sure, over there with Yolanda, who was just, ha, ha, ha. Oh, Reverend Brian. Well, Liam, you are, you are on the first Oh, that was the first, campaign. second, second yeah. time. Yeah. Was yeah. first I was time. on the first yeah. campaign. Um, and he, Reverend Jackson came to our church in Brooklyn in January, February of 83 and convened uh, black leadership to say, OK, y'all want me to run, but let's not have run Jesse run turn into see Jesse run. Mm -hmm. So y'all going to be with me or not? And then, you know, everybody was united that they would support Reverend. Um, and so that was our, my mm -hmm. first interaction with the campaign. But I think the two things I would lift up is one, for me, he changed the definition of winning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because prior to that, winning was winning the White House. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And his campaign allowed us to see winning in a different way by bringing hundreds of operatives, when the story mm -hmm. of Reverend Jackson really gets told, it will, it will include, as l in a large measure, the number of people he brought into the process. That's right. Mm -hmm. And trained and allowed to have opportunity, mm -hmm. who are now everywhere. Mm -hmm. Everywhere. And wh on whose shoulders a lot of the new elected officials stand. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a really key point. And the second thing he did is he changed the way the Democratic Party operated. That's right. It is because of Reverend Jackson that we have the rules we have mm -hmm. around presidential nominations. Because of his run, we got rid of winner take, take all. Mm -hmm. That's right. He's the reason we don't have winner take representation. all. Proportional representation. It's proportional mm -hmm. representation mm -hmm. because of the Jackson campaign. That was one of his demands mm -hmm. after the 88 campaign that the party had to change its rules. Mm -hmm. Republicans still do win a take all. Mm -hmm. We don't because of Reverend Jackson. Uh, the at large candidates, the so called superdelegates, we don't get capes, but they call us superdelegates. He made, he, that was part of his process mm -hmm. and part of his demands to diversify mm -hmm. the delegates at the party. Before that, they were S white men. So I'm glad you brought that up because the word superdelegates has now become a pejorative within the Democratic Party and among it's really a certain automatic segment. Delegates and and, and delegates so what you're saying is superdelegates had had a, a real pr a purpose other than yes. from some perspectives gaming the system yes. for no, and, 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 to, and for me, in the, in the last cycle, there were 712 superdelegates, or automatic delegates is the real term, mm -hmm. less than 15% of the overall total. That's right. And that is that was before the November election when we diversified who superdelegates were, even mm -hmm. through the election of Congress mm -hmm. and new yeah. governors and mm -hmm. so forth. I find it ironic that at this point in the party's history, when the automatic delegates would be almost 50% people of color, mm -hmm. now we want to do away with their influence. And it also did another thing. It kept Congress from running against its constituents. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because part of the reason why people couldn't become delegates is because most of the congressional members were running and taking up the slots. Mm -hmm. So having them as automatic just took that off the table and people could run and win fairly. Mm -hmm. So what you're going to have this cycle is now what you have is we have a record number of congressional black caucus members who mm -hmm. now have no voice mm -hmm. in the nomination Hispanic. process. Mm -hmm. A record number of Latino members. We mm -hmm. have our first Native, none of them, all of them now have no voice in the nomination process. And so you will be elected, electing a nominee 
who has, who has no, none of the African American, Latino, Native American, LGBT members of Congress, governors, and uh, community mm -hmm. activists mm -hmm. as part of who, the, who becomes the nominee. On the so first we, ballot. On the first least. ballot. So you basically <laughs> go back to the old system mm -hmm. where the majority community is controlling who the nominee That's is. That's right. I want to uh, read something that um, you, you say, Leah, about Reverend Jackson's first campaign. Uh, you say, we were building the airplane as we were flying. Yes, Lord. <laughs> we were just regular black people living our lives, and now, because of this man and his campaign and his influence, our vision has been raised. The idea of what's possible was different. He took us into rooms and into spaces we never imagined we would be in, mm -hmm. some of which we didn't even know existed. Mm -hmm. He made the space for us to experience American politics at the highest level. It was mm -hmm. like, okay, this is how it works, got it. Mm -hmm. Got it, that's right, that's got right. it. Um, in about maybe 15 minutes, we're gonna open it up to Q&A. There are microphones at the, on either, well, you can see them because yeah. I can't see, I can't see them with the There's lights. One here, one but they're here. The, in front of the stage at the end of either aisle, and we'll be taking questions. Um, I want to try to run through because this book is so packed with with information. And one of the key things is you had what was called the color girl color girls dinners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. How how did they get started? Why did they get started? And who was invited? Okay. Well, they got started because all of us, on some level, was invited to somebody's dinner. You know, in Washington, we have a habit of thinking we're more important than we are. That's just Washington. <laughs> so we were always invited to these dinners where presidential candidates were showing up. But w what we determined when we got to the dinners were they were great conversations, but the, the conversations were near, they rarely penetrated what, some of the things we wanted to talk about. And not just black issues. Sometimes we wanted to talk about foreign policy. You know, Africa is a foreign policy issue, and sometimes we just wanted to talk about that. But they never happened at those dinners. So we decided one day when we came out to dinners, we should do these dinners on our own. We put together our list. We, we made uh, three conditions to anybody that we invited. We felt like we had been a part of the party and we were strong enough to have them come. And it wasn't just us, we invited other African American women. So our first criteria was please come alone because what we're trying to do is introduce you to a group of women that you can reach out to around the country when you're, not by, you know, when you're out here campaigning. Number two, you have to pay for it because we're not trying to buy your support, so we, we want people to know that you pay for your own dinner. And number three was what? No press. No press. No press. Off the record. And it was only one candidate, that, uh, one potential candidate that showed up with a staff. Well, two showed up with somebody, but. Who? Uh, Bill Sack and President Obama. Okay. <laughs> Bill, uh, Governor Bill Sack, did he bring his wife? His wife. Yes, he brought his, his wife. wife. Right, mm -hmm. okay. Go on, and, uh -huh. <laughs> and, and, and President only, Obama. And only one went on, went, actually went on the record. Went on the record. And who was that? And it was oh. Snarky. Snarky It was President record. Obama. Obama. Person. Oh, we don't who, know went who, on, who went on the, yeah, who we went don't on know the record about what happened Yeah, we don't know who from that team went on the record, but somebody went on the record. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Talk to the press about Well, yeah. since you brought up that dinner, mm -hmm. he said something at that dinner that <laughs> took you all by surprise. It was the aha moment. Mm -hmm. The aha moment, and that was the one where he said, and I'm going to get it wrong because I don't have it noted here in the in my copy of the book. But he said at the dinner that he didn't think that race would be an issue in the campaign in 2008. He did. Yeah. And so he said that he was asked. He was asked how he was going to deal with the issue because of race. we also asked Hillary, you know, about uh, sexism. sexism. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, it was a it wasn't like it a was setup. A, yeah. Question. No. It was a, it was it was a regular standard. question. And we had we had formula questions for all of them. Donna, mm -hmm. and we always started with Donna, who was, what's your 2168 strategy? That was the number of delegates you needed to secure the nomination. And, and if, if they, they didn't know, know what was that. 2168 was, it was time to go. We yeah. would say check. Yeah. Did you ever walk out on anybody who didn't know? <laughs> no. no. Oh, we just start drinking. Yeah. We just did, then we didn't. <laughs> right. And we like, would like, drink next. more or we would diverse to another would, whole another conversation. Uh -huh. It would be an early night. Right. Uh -huh. It was actually some very good dinners, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, that was the first question. And then we asked them, you know, some other standard questions. And then with Obama, it was the race question. The yeah. rest question. Mm -hmm. And with Hillary, it was the sexism question. But on, on the race question with now then uh, Senator Obama, mm -hmm. 
uh, I can't remember which one of you had actually what I thought was a, a good analysis of why he said what he said in mm. the way he said it. Right. And I can't remember if it was you, Mignon, or I, you? It's Leah. Leah? I think it was Leah. Well, no. actually, probably, well, go ahead. Yeah. My thought at the time was, huh, well, that's interesting. And then what I had to reset was his background and his upbringing mm -hmm. was, he was raised in Kansas mm -hmm. and Hawaii and Indonesia. And so his lens of race would likely be different from me raised in Crown Heights. By white grandparents. By uh, white also. grandparents. By white yeah. grandparents. So some of, the, some of the talks that I had and my, my brother had, my sisters had, like, you know, leave the store with your stuff in the bag. You know, don't go out the store with your soda. If it's not in a bag, they might think you stole it, right? We all got that lesson. He, th those were not his experiences. And so having grown up that way, he might walk away or be at that point in his life believing that race wouldn't be an issue. You know, I also believe, candidly, just looking back on that answer, I, I, I honestly believe that some of the answer was um, shaped out of what Washington tends to instill in you, political correctness, because he didn't know half of the women sitting at that table. I think the other half is exactly what uh, Leah said, that you know, it was, you know, he was born to a different background. And I also think he was very hopeful, because at the time, the country was a little bit more mellow. It, wasn't, it certainly wasn't like explosive the way it is now. And I, you know, I just think he probably took for granted mm -hmm. that because, you know, you have to also remember it came after that wonderful speech that propelled him. The 2004. Mm -hmm. um, Where America wasn't purple, it, was, it wasn't red, blue, blue it was purple. purple or some color. It came after all that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, John, no red states, know. no purples, no blue yeah. states, the United so States. So, you know, I think we had an appreciation for it, but we also had, mm, Lord, we're gonna have to pick this back up again. So, so you do know that I one day at, at <laughs> 10th and G, Northwest Washington D.C., I get a call uh, from Mignon saying that Hillary had called her and that she was setting up a meeting for us to meet this young Senate hopeful because he needed some help in raising money and, and building up his visibility. So we 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 met him. I'm, I'm doing my fingers like this because. He had come into our office after having a smoke. <laughs> okay, and he he was like, "Okay, this is who Hillary wants us to help out," and we decided to give him all the help we could. We call up our friend Bill Lynch. We call up Alexis Herman. Call up everybody we knew in the Kerry campaign and say, "We have a terrific idea for a keynote speaker, mm -hmm. Barack Obama." That's right. So it was y'all. Yeah. Well, honey, we've been stirring more stuff up than you can imagine. Yeah, and it was a good choice. It was a great choice. I mean. Because Senator Kerry wanted, he didn't yeah. want the traditional elected right. official yeah. Yeah. congressperson. He wanted something fresh. Yeah. He wanted something new. So we said, got somebody for you. We got somebody yeah. new. And he's going to be a senator. Mm -hmm. so and we fulfilled that. Hillary's request of us. Mm-hmm. I, so, want, to, can I, go back young, young. I want to go back to the dinner, just one thing, I want to mention one thing that he said that he was absolutely right about. Uh, after all the questioning about the race and, you know, we talked about labor unions and he kind of said, well, if I build it, won't they come? And he just assumed that, you know, everybody would be there if he, if he became the nominee. Mm -hmm. But he did say, he said, this is my time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he understood that. He understood, yeah. we didn't understand that at the yeah. time. He understood that. It was his yeah. time. Yeah. He was always, the one thing I can tell you, because I actually worked for him, he is one person that I will always stand up for when you talk about knowing yourself. Mm -hmm. He knew himself. He knew that if he didn't do it then, it probably would never happen. Mm -hmm. I don't care how many people said, hey, this is not the right time. He understood the compass. Mm -hmm. Um, one more, a couple more questions before we open it up to, to Q and A. Mm -hmm. um, Donna, you you um, <clears throat> say in the book, kind of early on, when I wasn't working on the King holiday, I had the opportunity to be a fly on the wall as Mrs. King socialized with the women. A frequent combination was Dr. Shabazz, Dr. Maya Angelou, and Mrs. King. Mm -hmm. On special occasions, I'd go out and get them drinks. 
Dr. Shabazz liked Chateau Saint-Michel. Dr. Angelou had her favorite libation, as she called it. And Mrs. King liked champagne. Yes. They were the original colored girls. Oh, I love that. So then, which one is your corresponding colored oh, girl? Oh, my goodness. Mm. Oh, that's a good one. There's no, I love my, in fact, I had that libation on Saturday. Uh, what libation was it? <laughs> well, you know, Johnny, Johnny has friends. <laughs> Yeah, everybody Walker? know who Johnny Walk is. Johnny oh, comes. God. Johnny's blue, black, red, <laughs> silver. Johnny, you got enough money, you can get you a big old gold one too. <laughs> I used to keep one in my drawer because Johnny's a good friend. The blue one is the best. The blue is the best. It was forty dollars a glass though, and I was at a bar and I wasn't paying forty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I know how much it costs, but you know what I loved about it is that. They would allow you, and Mignon often tells the story about how she carried the purse. Mm -hmm. uh, but they would let you in the room, and you just listen. And the next day, sometime they wanted you to type it up, write it up, whatever they said. We all became press secretaries without knowing it, because mm -hmm. they would say, well, put out a press release. Well, who's going to put out the press? We became press secretaries. <laughs> right. And, like, and we call the press. Everything, Donald. Everything, the drivers, whatever they wanted. Drivers. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was such a great honor to, to be in their presence. And, you mm -hmm. know, this is in the book, too, but when Rosa Parks passed away, I mean, we're laughing now. It's not funny. But we wanted to have a dignified funeral for her. And to, to have a dignified funeral at the Capitol, the Rotunda, which Mignon and Leah and Yolanda can also expose upon. But... We, uh, there's a story in a book about when Mrs., uh, when we were laying Mrs. Parks to rest and we had the honor guards and they were the Capitol honor guard. When we got we to the church, the, the historic Metropolitan AME, mm -hmm. honor guards like, well, okay, we're done. Okay, here's the body. Oh. Here's the body. We're, like, we're like, okay, we're we'll take her in. It's, they're ready. People sitting. They're like, well, we can't. That's just another transfer. It's like transfer of power. Right. We're like, they don't have the, the jurisdiction. Capital right. Out of their jurisdiction. So we so had we to get the like, Metropolitan. Uh, or we were going to be carrying that. We were going to carry her cast. Oh, yeah. Her oh, yeah. We, we were ready. We Heels were ready. and all. Ready. <laughs> so we, 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 we had her laid out like a state funeral. Yep. Because <laughs> she was our, she was the first woman to lie in it's state. state. And state the U.S. Capitol Rotunda. And the White House sent a special, what you call those things? Because if I die, I want some, too. What you call them? What, what, no, them the stands reef? with the flower. Oh, the wreath. The wreath. Oh, uh -huh. White House sent wreath. And we didn't know you're supposed to return it to the White House. We put it on the plane to go to Detroit. Detroit. <laughs> we, <laughs> said, we said it. We said it. We said it. With the flowers, with the braids. Well, Listen, the people. Think the White House wanted the wreaths back? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So oh, special yeah, wreath. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh I, I, we didn't and know. And we didn't know. We just knew that she deserved the honor. She deserved yep. it. And so we started, they called <laughs> Mignon first, and then she called me, and she called, and we started planning this whole. Because you know they had no money planning. They, they, so, they didn't have and it was money. extravagant. So we, we made all this plan, first. and then we had to raise the money to pay for mm -hmm. all of this, including her family had to come. So I, I was the chief of staff for the DNC, so I was like, well, the DNC will pay. Yeah, AFT paid. AFT a paid. And then for I called song. Condoleezza Rice because we need the Southwest. We need a plane. We need a plane. Oh. Oh. You know, they had her going around the country. Everybody. She, we'll, she, we'll she had a multi stop a funeral. Yeah. It was three funerals. There were three yeah. funerals. There was the three. one in Alabama, yeah. Alabama, Alabama Detroit, and then Detroit, and Detroit, and Washington. DC. And we had to fly her. Yeah. So we got off topic. So I want to know. I hate to say it, but a funeral was some like a highlight of our life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Dr. Heinz a lot of funerals. Six different events in three days. Yeah. Wow. Oh, we do funerals yeah, very we do well. Funerals. And and we don't allow anyone to die without dignity. We, we write you up. We have dignity. We believe in that. These these are our heroes. These are people who raised us, who taught us everything. That's right. And we honor them. Yeah. And when Dr. Hype died, we oh called Nancy God. Pelosi. Yes, we did. And <laughs> Nancy Pelosi brought the entire Democratic caucus of the Congress That's to right. NCNW's headquarters where Dr. Hype was laying in repose. That's right. She put loaded them up on buses, and she was the mm -hmm. first one off the bus. That's right. That's right. To uh, bring all the Democratic members of Congress. And there were some Republicans who came yeah. also. And we had the when funeral at National passed, Cathedral. We all Same thing. Right to Chicago. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. To work with Pat, to not work with, but to be it's there. That's what for they deserve. Them. That's what they deserve. We will do that. Yeah. Uh, there's a there's a story you've told before, and I want you to tell it again about Dr. Height 
You talked to you, you. I thought you were going to bring it up earlier when you know she went to work at seven in the morning. Oh, and the dog. She, when oh, she was going to work at seven in the morning in full kit, hat, oh, yeah. matching <laughs> outfit. Oh, yeah. What were you matching doing? Matching shoes. So Dr. Height lived on one. I was on two. Alexis was on six. And I had a little dog back then, so I would have to walk the dog in the morning. So I would, after I had gotten my morning phone call from Dr. Height, I would put on whatever the first thing was my hand touched to walk the dog. So I was looking like I don't, you know, basically just, just walking the dog. And I'd go down to the <laughs> lobby with my dog, Cola, and I try, and I get so far, and there would be Dr. Height waiting for her driver. And I was like, this lady, oh, lady, 7 a.m., she is fully dressed. <laughs> Hat, gloves, shoes, the matching outfit, lipstick, and First I'm looking and like, thing. I just, just a mess. And I try to slink out the back door <laughs> and hope, because I had already talked to her that day. I slink out the back mm -hmm. door, and as soon as I turn the corner, go to her, she said, Miss Daughtry? <laughs> she probably checking on her list. Good. <laughs> and I say, good morning, Dr. Hyde. And she said, and how are you? I said, I'm just fine. She said, and how is Brother Herb? She's talking about my dad. I said, he's fine, Dr. Hyde. Like I hadn't just talked to her. And she's like, then she'd go. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else that you need, Dr. Hyde? <laughs> and she said, no, I will speak to you later. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am, I'll talk to you later. And I'd go slink right on out the back door, and then, you know, and we'd walk the dog and cotton. By the time I come back, she was gone. She was in the car and gone to work. I want to I wanna end this, this part of our conversation. My reading, I, I had this, there's lots of advice throughout mm. the book, and there's a particular chapter at the end, advice for for people, particularly women, who want to run for office. One of them is watch who's around you, as in who's in your squad. Mm -hmm. You need a cheerleader, a coach, mm -hmm. a compass, and a confidant. Mm -hmm. And that comes way after this particular line here on page 129. And I can't even remember the context, but on page 129, Mignon is the glue. She's the connective tissue that keeps us together. To the outside world, we are a group of powerful black women. But among ourselves, we are strong-willed, grown women who don't always see eye to eye. Mignon can always bring us back to the loving place, though, for any colored girls, or anyone for that matter, who forms a group with the, with the intent of wielding some kind of political power. Having a Mignon to keep them together is the most important thing, especially when the going gets rough. That was pre-book tour though, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> I don't know how we've kept together doing this. <laughs> well, I mean, this is, the other th this is the other thing about the book. You guys are not shy about, no. well, what you see on stage here is like get. four really good friends <laughs> who've been, th been through a lot. But they talk about the times when they stopped talking to each other, yeah. when they were fighting with each other. When you other. get dropped from the email chain. <laughs> I think I went. I think I've been the longest. Yeah, I, I, I went she out was for about six months, six months. multiple yeah. times. Multiple, multiple times. times. It's okay, y'all. <laughs> and then, I but see, Donna but then they'll come to my house and they'll redecorate. They'll decorate my house and and well, she tell me my too. Christmas tree so was in the wrong place. We so we went to her house and for Christmas and the furniture was wrong. It was off. It was just, <laughs> no, the Christmas tree was off. Like, the Christmas tree was in the I wrong was off. space. There was no fondue way. So we just rearranged all the furniture. Just, and it's still like that And today. it's still like that. Oh. I, I don't know how to change it back. <laughs> <laughs> But it was better when we finished. Yeah, yeah it, it is better. better. And yeah. no one complains about it now. And I'm like, when are they coming over to tell me I need to paint? <laughs> <laughs> so if Mignon is the connective, is the connective tissue, is, does that mean, is she the cheerleader? Because you say you need a cheerleader, a coach, no. a compass, a compass. No, we're not talking about ourselves. No, no, we're not even talking about ourselves the next. What? We weren't mm -hmm. talking about us. We were just talking about this is, no. this is the kind of person. No, I understand that. No, I, that, I know but what they mean by that is that, you know, we all get mad at each other on different levels and different, you know, somebody get mad at this one, I get mad at that one. We all do that. But for some reason, I, you know, I will find my way back to everybody because I just don't want that in my spirit. 
And so I love, I love these women. Like I love them with passion and you know, they are like my real, real best friends. And so I hate for us to fight, but we do. <laughs> and so I will find some kind of way to try to slowly get us back together. Because Donna, will even, she's the one that's usually the outcast, to be honest. Really, Donna? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, we'll find some kind of way. You know, she'll email me, and I'll, I'll, get, I'll soften I'll, up. I'll, I'll, and then I'll email, I'll email Leah. When, when <laughs> we're fighting, afraid. everybody <laughs> goes yeah, to Mignon. Softy. That's what it is. Well, because yes, Mignon you know, will listen to everybody. <laughs> She, she will listen. Touch. She yeah. listen, and she will help you see the other side of of the person the that argument. you're pissed off with. So she's the diplomat. Yeah, and so she you so diplomat. you say, I okay, I hadn't thought about that one. Yeah. So maybe she's I'll call more diplomatic than me. I don't give a damn. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, they're more important. Now you know, I do like the other. She day, gives a darn when she not when we not talk about it. And she that's true. That line. Uh, I don't like nobody. Let me tell you something though. As mad as they might make me, sometimes <laughs> I will never let anybody cross them. Yeah. yeah. Right. I don't play we that. We, we, we got our own issues because, you know, we... We like married... Well, I guess don't, don't married. Don't we could be like married. Couple. Like married couple. Couple. It's like sisters. I can talk about my sister, but you, you can't can. talk about it. You yeah. can't talk about it's my sister. Yeah. That's will, the way we, we feel. Will, we in a foxhole right. if it's trouble. Well, you, can't get you know what the us. best thing? Mignon and Lee and I are on the rules committee, and sometimes we don't talk before we sit down. We can't. We don't let everybody know what we're talking and, but, about. But if Leah says something, Mignon says something, and I say, oh, it's going to get hot now. <laughs> and we just throw, throw, and throw. And, and then we leave out the room, everybody coming around us like we have been thinking about it. See, they're always no, looking to see it. what one of us are going to say. Leah might so take the lead. So I said, like, in the last go-round, yeah. we just changed the party rules, and you know, I go to the meetings, I take my knitting because it's a, they're eight-hour meetings. Yeah. So we were going through the rules, and I just said, I looked up, and I said, and they were laughing at me. I said, I just have a question. I have a question, very innocently. Because, you know, some like of you have been in the committee the longer than before. me. <laughs> so I just want to know, why do we have membership requirements for delegates, yeah. but not for presidential candidates? Why do the people who are running for delegate have to be a member of the Democratic Party, but people who are running for president do not? Can somebody I, tell me that? I think that that's a, a fabulous shame. question. And I went back to my knitting, and, then they, <laughs> and everybody looked around. Donna had that exact face on. Because <laughs> you and know, I, know. Know, I, I couldn't even. I couldn't. I'm like, wait, and then I, I couldn't I, even compose myself when Leah said that. I'm like, oh, let me just take this. Wait, one and out. we got three or four people that's like with us, and I get the text. And, Did she just say what I thought she said? What are we going to do? We vote yes. <laughs> By the time it was over, we changed the party rules. Yes, if you right. want to be the nominee, you must be a Democrat. That's right. And so this was at the it's October in the 2017 in, the rules. Yes, in Las in the Vegas. Rules. Yes. yes. We did it. Yeah. Yeah, you have and to. And tell them we did it. <laughs> we did it. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to know. I just had a question. <laughs> <laughs> it's now part of the rules of the Democrats. You have to, in fact, sign a, a piece of paper, paper saying that you are a certified member of the Democratic Party in order to run for president now. And the purpose of that is because you have Democrats out here running and then you have, you have the short line and the long line. Yeah. And so the short line can get in and you ain't got no title that says D, but the people that have invested in the party mm -hmm. and really spent a lot of time, and it's not fair to the members out there that's trying to help them either. They have to get to know these candidates we that have to eventually build the go party. back. But also the yeah. nominee is the head of the party. party yeah. right. and we won't you cannot be the head of the party and if you're, you're not, not a, a member, member of, of the party. party. <laughs> that, that would make any sense. Right. That would be right. Go, go run in your own party. Be, a, be in charge of that. Yeah. Yeah. Come over that's kind of what we were thinking when she that's said like that. Electing, that's like electing a Republican to be our nominee. It doesn't make any sense. You want to be in charge of me, then you're going to have to be it's in the, in the rules. I was, waiting, rules. I was waiting for somebody out there Ladies to say, wow. And but Learn nobody the rules. Did. <laughs> Learn the okay. Rules. Um, again, the microphones <laughs> are at the, at the end of either aisle up here at the stage. I implore you, you to ask a question, a short know. question. Please, no statements. If you start making a speech, I don't mean to be rude, but I'm going to have to cut you off, and I'm going to be rude doing it. Um, <laughs> while you make your way to the microphones, I just to amplify what Leah, what Leah was just saying, she said in her remarks that you have in the book at the DNC meeting in October of last year in Las Vegas, you said, we don't have time or resources to waste time, fight, waste time fighting each other, mm -hmm. fighting each other about who's the most progressive, mm -hmm. who's the most loyal, who's on what committee, who's got what position. Help me, Holy Ghost, we don't have time. time. That's right. 
But now we have time for your questions. Oh, come on. There's no, <laughs> nobody's lined up at the microphones. Come on now. Don't be shy. They're not. They're moving. Here they yeah, come. Her buttons on. You got there first, Los buttons. Angeles. <laughs> Hi. 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 Uh, my name's Juliana. I'll make it brief, like you said. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you guys so much. Like, I learned so much from hearing about your experiences. But my question is, like, as a student here at NYU mm -hmm. studying the arts, I feel the opposite about politics. Like, my calling doesn't feel, like, drawn to there. So mm -hmm. now in this political climate, I find myself realizing that I'm really far behind on like understanding the history of these political parties mm -hmm. and understanding and keeping up with all of the current events and like the historical context behind it. So when someone says something ignorant, I have historical facts to back it up versus mm -hmm. emotion. So do you happen to have any advice for someone who doesn't necessarily love politics but wants to get more into it? Mm. Buy the book. <laughs> Oh, you can't, oh, you're signing books out, yeah. outside, so you can And I'm not them. saying that, because, but, but we cover so much history, yeah. mm -hmm. at least the last 30 years. So you'll be caught up. <laughs> and I think it will give you a deep understanding of the current trajectory of the party, as well as the current trajectory of the country. But more importantly, you, you can take a look back as you begin to pay it forward. Because this book is also about you and how you can make a difference in the future. Right. We need more of you to serve. Why you? Because there's no one better. And why now? Because tomorrow's not soon enough. We need more young people to prepare to take their seats at the mm -hmm. table. So if no one has asked you yet to run for office one day, can I ask you, you right quick, office. what type of art are you? Uh, acting in theater. OK, let me just say, I went back to school in 2009 for film, to film school. And I went deliberately because I thought the images of our people and of women in particular were skewed. Use that art, use your performances to shed a light on what is good about your people, what is good about women, what is good about this country. You don't even have to get involved in politics, but there is a space in the arts that can help change how people see us because you know all y'all do all day is look at these machines anyway. So make sure these machines are reflective. Okay, I'm gonna say it, iPad. Okay, I'll say it. <laughs> Make sure your iPhones and your iPads are reflective of the images you want to see. Use your art for a higher calling. That's what I say. We still right. need you to serve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Question here. Hi. Hi there. You can lower, lo you can lower the mic down. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, you guys are all obviously very strong black women, and you seem to be very confident in yourself and very sure of yourself. Um, but how do you kind of deal with, like, wanting to go into politics, having that calling, but having everything around you make you feel like it's not possible or it's not attainable. Mm. Um, what, what do you do to keep yourself uplifted or um, encouraged? Thank you. Well, first, first of all, buy, buy the book again, buy the book, chapter 25 <laughs> is a how-to, and it will probably answer a lot of your questions. But uh, I think, but I think oh, that once you start having, I think you're young, and once you start having successes, you build more and more confidence. Mm -hmm. You know, get out here and go volunteer for somebody, something, mm -hmm. or run for, for office at the school. Um, but just, you know, little steps, little baby steps, but just put your foot in the water and just keep on going. Don't let anything turn you back. Yeah. And I'd say, go ahead, go ahead, Liz. Confidence is a decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Decide mm -hmm. to be confident, mm -hmm. decide to be bold. That's, That's right. good. That's right. Decide to step out there. Yeah. Decide to succeed. Those, those are things within your control. Mm -hmm. You can decide how confident you want to be. Make yeah. the decision and, and, and get out there and do whatever it is you want to do. And, and I would also say, dovetailing on what the young sister said before, there, oh, there are levels to politics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about electoral politics mm -hmm. up here. Right. But the economy is political. Oh, right. Art mm -hmm. is political. Mm -hmm. Every aspect of our lives in mm -hmm. America has a political lens because politics is simply the decision-making process through which somebody decides who's going to get what, when, where, and how. So if you understand politics as a much larger construct, mm -hmm. then we're all political beings. Yes. We all, mm -hmm. in whatever field we choose, you, you can impact the decision-making process about that field in a way that can impact people's lives. Mm -hmm. And I have one other thing, and I just learned this here just about a month ago, 
because I was asking, I, I was meeting with a group of Norwegian women. Mm. And so I asked the question about, because they were, you know, they were strong. I used the word strong. And so one of the questions I asked her was, you know, how do you guys actually portray women in your country? Because to me in America, I still think we have a problem portraying <laughs> strong women. It's like a threat. And she said, the first thing you can do is stop calling them strong because you make them look different. Mm. We are women and we just happen to be strong. So I would, you know, when you say we're all strong women, you're strong too, but I wouldn't even use that word. We're all women trying to accomplish the same things. And I think Leah said it best, your choice is your confidence. No, let nobody tell you that you are not good at anything. And I just believe that to my kernel core, whatever you set your mind to do, you can do it. Whether it's politics, I say go, listen girl, all you gotta do is go out here and go to one of these grocery stores in these neighborhoods and you see all that alcohol being sold, tell them quit selling it, that's politics. Well don't sell it on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a compromise. compromise. That's a compromise. Compromise. <laughs> um, because ladies and gentlemen, let's be honest. Let's okay, be I won't honest. be too I, drastic. I, I like people, I, I always tell people this. What was Jesus' first miracle? Wine. He turned water into wine. He listened to his mother and got the party started. And by the way, he was a millennial. He was a millennial most of his life. He saw injustice and he went out to yeah. fight and yeah. struggle. But I started at the age of nine. My first campaign was to get a playground built in my community. I mean, remember, I grew up in the segregated South. There were no playgrounds on the other side of the tracks. The white kids had playgrounds, and we were not allowed to go and play there unless the white kids, it was our designated night or designated time period. And so I advocated for a playground. I was a kid, nine years old. Even after Hurricane Katrina and Ike and Florence and everybody else, that playground is still there in Louisiana. So it's important that you mm -hmm. make that decision mm -hmm. of when and where you want to enter, and That's I hope right. you choose to enter. Yeah. I really do. We'll we need, we need more you. people. We'll be looking for you. Thank you very much. Question here. Hi, my name is Nick Pinosla. I'm the co-founder of an organization called Women Work. We tackle issues around um, discrimination against women in the workforce, discrimination of women in politics. Um, one thing I'd love to hear your thoughts on are some of the ways in which uh, data shows women voting differing across race and class. Um, it's often been said that Democrats, Democratic women are the backbone of the party, particularly black women. But when you look at class and race, you see that some people don't vote first as women, they vote first by their race. Um, what are your thoughts on this? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I must say that what this election say? cycle, we did, see, we did see a slight improvement over yeah. 2016. And that is, we saw a slight improvement of white college educated women in the suburbs, mm -hmm. right, white rural women, uh, white non-college educated women, and Latinos in, mm -hmm. in some states. Their voter turnout were not that great uh, compared to black women. Uh, but we're making improvements, and all I want to say is that we need, a, we need to do a little bit more work and ensuring that we can get a broad array of women mm -hmm. to support progressive policies, because uh, if we do, we can, you know, ensure that Donald Trump is a one-term president. No, if we don't do that, we have to make sure that in every corner of this earth, we are getting out the people that have our value system. Because if we yep. can't depend on them, we have to depend on people that we know will come to the polls and do the right thing. And there's a thing that we say mm -hmm. in politics, uh, which is that why are these people voting against their interests? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a very dangerous statement because the reality is they are voting with their interests. Right. Mm -hmm. Their interests just don't happen to be our interests. Right. Well. But we don't understand what their interests are. And I think in the case of what we saw like at Stacey Abrams where 72% of white women voted for her opponent. And 15% of black men. And 15% so. yeah. of yep. black men. Yep. The right. interests mm -hmm. aren't ones that we understand. Mm -hmm and that we can align with. Mm -hmm. And in the case of white women, I think that they, in that case, their race mm -hmm. trumps their, uh, their, their sex. Mm -hmm. And that's just, they, they see the world, they choose to see the world mm -hmm. through a system that privileges them mm -hmm. and where the privilege works for them. 
And so why change something that's working for me? Mm -hmm. So, but I think we have to first start and, and really say, examine the statement when we say they're voting against their interests. No, they're not. Right. Now you, and, right. and we're never going to change it if we don't understand how they are perceiving their mm -hmm. interests, and then we can begin to address mm -hmm. it. Question here. Hi, my name is Mira Dave G. I'm a, an attorney and a professor here. Um, I, I'd like to ask each of you, if I may, to talk to us about one of the worst career mistakes that you've made. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Donna, you go last. Hmm. Yolanda? I can't, I'm trying to think of one. It got to nope. be something, but I mean, from the time, from the, well, I, I made some before I, I started working in politics professionally, <laughs> let's put it that way. Once, <laughs> once I started, once I started in real politics, I worked for my brother-in-law, who was a state legislator, and then I went to work for Barbara Mikulski after that. I can't really, I, I don't think I made any bad decisions career-wise. I learned to trust my instincts very early, and I learned to the networking was very important. And I always, I did those things and I constantly did it. And I can't, I can't think of any job that I took after that that was a bad decision for me. Some people, some people thought working for, going to work for Reverend Jackson was, but I didn't feel that way. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, that's a wonderful question, but I, I think I must agree with uh, Yolanda. Not that I've been so privileged to not step into potholes once I'm on the job. Yeah. But I don't think I can recall there's, that there's been any job that I've taken that has really been a, oh my God, what the heck did I do yeah. this for? I mean, I've always been very deliberate and pur purposeful. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I tell you, when you're a public servant, you tend to go where you think you can serve. And it's just now that we're looking at our careers in a, through a different lens. But when we were coming through, it was always about service. So we never had the, we never had the choice to say, oh, this is a bad decision. Because even if you were working for somebody that, you know, didn't pay you a lot of money and, well, you know, because I, I remember when Reverend Barrow asked me to come to Operation Push, I had a very good job. I had benefits. I had a package, as they say these days. And when she asked me to come, she asked me to give up that package and come work for my people. And I'm like, well, do I get help here? <laughs> but the point is, that even that decision became the best decision mm -hmm. of my life. So I think, you know, through a lens of public service, you can always find a place where you're going to feel good about what you're doing, even in the worst circumstances. So yeah. for me, um, mm -hmm. There hasn't been any, any job that I've taken that I've regretted. Mm -hmm. I've, I believe they're all divinely ordered mm -hmm. as, as a reflection of my faith. There have been some things I've done in those jobs. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That I wish I hadn't. Right. Or I, I wish I'd done differently. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, one, just one that I'll talk about is I think that it took me too long to understand my worth and my value in the workplace. Mm -hmm. It, uh, I under, for many years, I underestimated my value in the workplace, mm -hmm. so I didn't ask for the salary that I deserved. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask for the assignments that I wanted mm -hmm. because I didn't understand in, in my younger years what I was bringing mm -hmm. to the workplace. And those things I regret, that I hadn't been bolder, that I hadn't mm -hmm. been more assertive at certain points, particularly in the beginning of my career. Now, you know, these days, you know, I think as you move up the ladder, you, I've gained a lot of confidence, and so some things I just ain't gonna do right. on the job, I'm, or, with a, or with a client, or with a, as a, I do a lot of consulting work in there. Mm -hmm. I know what my bar is, I know what I can do, I know when I have to say no to something that might be lucrative, but it's not my value system, or some, you know, some people that I don't wanna work with. And I'm good with that. They might not be, but I'm good with that. <laughs> but I, I understand now what I bring, and so I'm not uh, ashamed or embarrassed or shy about creating the circumstance that will allow me to thrive. Okay, we've got nine minutes left, Donna, and then we'll come over here for you questions. Did, he didn't mean to give you the nine minutes. No, no, oh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mignon. No, Donna, you do not have nine minutes. No. Just, <laughs> to answer the question, sure. just give, give one. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, if I had to go back after 2009 when Barack Obama said to me, Donna, what do you want? 
I would have said at that time, give me an ambassadorship to a country without hurricanes and left the country. And I would have come back you know, in 2017 and said, oh, what did y'all just go through? Huh? Um, being chair of the party the first time was delightful because just a few, few weeks, a month or two. Being the chair the second time, I had no idea what I was doing. I, not in terms of the job. I had no idea that we were going up against a foreign military intelligence unit that not only threatened our country, mm -hmm. undermined our nominee, and tried to destroy our party. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. Had someone written and said, Donna, don't do this, mm -hmm. because it means, but you know what? I'm a better woman because of it. Yep. And now I feel very strongly about protecting our democracy. Mm -hmm. And I feel very passionate about saving this country from the forces that would undermine us and destroy us simply because they disagreed with us. But I had no idea. I would have looked at Obama when he said, what do you want? I would have said, honey, send me to that island where there's no hurricane. <laughs> well, yeah, hurricane. <laughs> All right, we've got three people, three people lined up and I want to get you, all, get you all in real quickly, real quickly your questions, go. Hello ladies, my name is Sophie Gideon and I am a Masters of Public Administration student at NYU's Wagner School of Public Service. And I'm actually wow. very interested in going into politics. Um, Question. Be before coming to tonight, I <laughs> was more interested on be in being like a legislator, but after yeah. listening to all of the power that you guys have and to impact change and influence the, the way of history, I wonder what you guys think. Is it more impactful to be behind the scenes or to be visible? One of you take that. Yolanda, go oh, ahead, since yeah, you're gonna talk. Both, I mean, <laughs> being out there is one thing, but it depends on you and how, yeah, your skill set and how you feel about it. Mm -hmm. I have never wanted to run for public office, but I love being behind the scenes. I like to be a king maker mm -hmm. and not the and king. And queen maker. Queen maker, yes, king and queen. <laughs> All right, we'll go here, quick. Hey, my name is Lauren Darden. Um, I'm a student here at NYU in Tisch School of the Arts for Dramatic Writing. Um, you guys all mentioned how you started like this like love for politics at a young age, so clearly you had a lot of accomplishments and goals. Now I kind of want to know after like accomplishing all those things, what's next? What's your goal? What's, what's for tomorrow? What do you guys want to do? Oh, Ooh. Mignon, you take that one. Um, I hope to one day actually be one of these great filmmakers out here that's really setting a tone for how we really look at women and how we look at humanity and people. I'm not trying to do just goody two-shoe films, but I am trying to change the tra trajectory on how they look at black women in particular and women in general on TV, on cable. So I hope to have an influence in that. And she can hire me, I wanna be an actress. <laughs> 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 Whose office did you camp in when you were there? Was you, were you Mignon's intern? Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. And that was after, what, when did that happen? After uh, the Gore. This was after, after the Gore campaign. Yeah. After, after the Gore campaign. I went back to, after Harvard, and then I went back to the DNC. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, thank you. This Question one. here. Hi, my name is Kiralee Harry. I'm the youth representative for Brooklyn Community Board 9, Ooh. and youngest person in the United States to be appointed. And Yay. I wanted to know. <laughs> Yay! Yay! And I wanted to know, after the past election with having to flip the ballots, a lot of people didn't know how much effect it would have on community board members like myself. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know what role you think community boards play in this entire political system. Mm -hmm. uh, Leah. Leah. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> community boards, that's uh, something we have in New York. Not every, we have, in DC is something different. And I think those, those yeah, we call them ANCs, those folks, community board members, are like your local, they live next door, community activists. And so what they can do, the important role they play is that they know the neighborhood on a very granular level. So you are the people who can go door to door with a sample ballot and say, hey, Miss, Miss Sally, let me help you understand this issue or the trash pick up days are about to change or whatever, whatever the issue is. So it's a, it's a really important role because you understand it on a very micro level, and that's important. I was in Washington getting texts from people in Brooklyn saying, how do I vote mm. on, these, on, the, on the back of the, the things that were on the yeah. back about the community boards and mm -hmm. the diversity and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, I got, let me go get the ballot so I could tell people how to vote because no one in the community was going and talking yeah. to folks, so that's a job for you to make sure the folks in your area know what's on the ballot, understand, because those things are confusing. Yes. 
Mm -hmm. I had to read it five times before I could figure out. So Cute. that's a job for community board people. You're uniquely situated to have those granular discussions with people because you know the neighborhood, you know the neighbors, they will welcome you, they'll hear it from you, and you can help them become more engaged in what's happening. Question. Hi, Thank hi you. ladies, how are you doing? Um, not a millennial, do I look it, pushing 50. So going back to school, <laughs> yeah, black don't crack. Um, the, qu <laughs> the quick question is, since we're talking about ageism, term limits, for or nay? Term limits for elected officials, you for them or against them? Who wants to take that? Oh. Madam Chairwoman, or Minya. And I'll tell you why, it's a simple reason. I think the term limits come from the voters themselves. When you're, when you're ready for change, you vote that change out. I know incumbency is a problem, but I'm against it. Uh, there are times in which we need the experience of those who have served, and we need to maintain some level of experience in government, and therefore, I don't believe in general and term limits. But I do know in certain circumstances, I wish we would have a rotating seat of two for some people to like leave the room. Yes. <laughs> okay. A different form of term and, limits. and all you have to do is look at the Senate Judiciary Committee during the Kavanaugh yes. hearing and know what I'm talking about. <laughs> some of them were there during the Nita Hill. I mean, oh, yeah. yeah. Yep, we've got two Time minutes go. left. Last question here. Hi, ladies. My name is Kirsten Magwood, NYU alum. Actually, I used to work with you, Donna, at Eleanor Holmes Norton's office in 1992. Yes. Um, I'm really excited about the book. I'm excited you to be a filmmaker. That's what I do now. And my Yay, question for all you of you. You can teach me. Girl, let's go together <laughs> on it. I love your vision. My question. question is 2020. Who is taking Donald Trump out for the Democratic Party? Who okay. That is a great last question. And we're gonna start with Leah and go down, go down the list. No need to explain. Yep. Just give a name. Oh, you just want a name? Just, yeah, just give a name. Who, who do you think? Who do you think could take the person out of, of office? <laughs> right. Electorally. For the Secret Service, that might just, be lurking around. I just around. need to be clear. At yes. the ballot box. Who That's can make right. him a one-term president? I agree. I don't have a favorite. I don't know yet. I, I, I'm waiting to be courted. Me too. Yeah, I think we all This are. is my when first presidential that I won't be neutral, because I've always worked for the party and I have to be neutral. So this will Ooh. be my first cycle where I'm waiting to be courted. And I see, <laughs> well, I see who's who and what's what. I'm a C. I don't know. I think we're going to have so many options. We're going to have more options than we've ever had in terms of diversity. You know, there may be four African Americans running. I know two Hispanics that may run, several women. Um, the old white guys, and then some young white guys. <laughs> <laughs> Mignon? And you may have your yep. first openly gay person run yeah. for president. Oh, I, think it's gonna be, yeah. I think it's going to be open. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. I love it. Mayor Buttigieg. Yes. Mignon. Yeah, I, I actually just think it's rather early to try to figure that, that question out. I think the real question is what type of person, not yeah. the person. And the type of person has to have, I think it, you almost have to be multifaceted in terms of being a highly inspirational candidate, you gotta be a mean candidate, mm -hmm. because you gotta come at it on so many different mm -hmm. levels with him, because he's such a dogmatic candidate, so I think the type of candidate is The important. clock has struck eight. Donna, you? I don't have a favor, but I can tell you that we're gonna have an exciting presidential season. Please uh, stay in touch, uh, tune in, because this is going to be one of the great presidential election seasons in our history. And in terms of the, in the, 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 the last comment is actually something that is attributed to, that Mignon says at the, end, at the end of the book, and really is sort of a coda for this entire conversation for this book and for what you've just advised, thinking about 2020. Mignon, you say that, you say, my mind stays in the framework of Harriet Tubman all the time. When you hear the dogs barking, keep going. If you hear the dogs, keep going. If you see the torches in the woods, keep going. If they're shouting after you, keep going. Don't ever stop. Keep going. If you want a taste of freedom, keep, keep going. going. The name of the book is Four Colored Girls Who Have Considered Politics. Donna Brazil, Yolanda Caraway, Leah Daughtry, and Mignon Moore.